All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca podcast episode. And I am really stoked for this conversation. I'm here with a relatively new friend of mine, George Mitchell. George, thanks for hanging out with me today. Well, thanks for having me, Nathan. I appreciate it. Continuing the conversation. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of continuing the conversation, so to give a little bit of context to our listeners, uh, you and I had the chance to connect at WPPI in Vegas this year before our worlds all kind of went upside down and changed pretty significantly when we right. could actually sit in person and have a conversation. And uh, <laughs> it was a really compelling conversation. And we, we started to kind of dig into this topic of diversity in the, phot- the photography industry. And, and I, you know, we got into it a bit and then I was like, Hey, can, can we take this to the podcast? And, and you were gracious enough to, to do just that. So we're going to, we're going to talk about, we're going to get into this topic of, of diversity in the photography industry in a bit more detail here in just a bit. But I normally start off with a series of questions for my guests, because first of all, you are a photographer and a, like a super talented photographer at that. I want to talk about your photography business. Yeah, um, for sure. And, and just to give context to our listeners, gmitchellphoto.com, just like it sounds, uh, uh-huh. two L's, uh, on, of course, at the website, gmitchellphoto.com, and then gmitchellphoto on Instagram for everybody listening in. Make sure you check it out. We'll put it in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. George, you're a really talented food and beverage and people photographer, but your beverage photography is what really stands out to me. How did you even get into this in the first place? Oh, <laughs> well, I will be honest. I had purchased uh, some lighting gear and in the middle of the Michigan winters, okay, um, you know, things kind of slow down, especially in the, in the, in the uh, December months. Okay. And, you know, I <laughs> felt a little guilty. I had this gear. I'm not utilizing it. I'm, you know, just not putting it to its uses or through its paces, right? Okay. So, uh, watching a commercial, I saw a beer commercial and I was like, man, you know, this, this is lit very well. And, uh, I wonder how, you know, people get, uh, these different aspects of a beer to look cold and wet or uh, to get the glow through the bottle. So I was, I was seriously intrigued and I started looking around online to find beverage photographers. And I came across a gentleman by the name of Rob Grimm. Okay. And uh, he had a tutorial out and I, you know, bought the tutorial and eventually got an opportunity to take a workshop directly under Rob uh, for a matter of days. Uh, and I've been off and running ever since. But that was my initial attraction to it was just the, uh, you know, just being intrigued by seeing the commercials, the different commercials and, and you know, some of the print ads when it came to uh, to beverage photography. Yeah. And it, it truly became, uh, it, it has this level of difficulty. And that's what keeps me going is coming up with these crazy concepts and trying to figure out how to bring that to life in photography, uh, you know, and, you know, making the image. So that's what keeps me going with it. But that's definitely how I got started and got, got caught up in this whole crazy world of beverage photography. <laughs> well, but I, I love that you love a challenge. That, that's what, that's what's, or part of what's so compelling to you is the challenge of it, the technical difficulty of it. I, I have a lot of respect definitely. for that. A lot of people would see something difficult and they're like, eh, not for me. And they go the other way. And you're like, bring <laughs> right. it on. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge. I mean, we're talking about lighting glass, yeah. um, lighting liquid. So there's a lot of reflections and, and you know, trying to get light to, to bounce through different densities of glass or colors of glass and things of that sort. It's always a science equation, right? It's 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 a lot of sitting still, sitting in front of your set, looking and and going through the paces of 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 those tools in your toolkit, right? Where to position light or or how to create a lighting pattern use you know, using things that you've been taught along the way or you figured out along the way, um, it, it definitely becomes it can be problematic. I mean, and then you couple things into that, like some of the things that are used to help you, like using multiple polarizers can also enter a level of difficulty yeah. uh, when you're looking to, you know, capture an image because now you have to work those polarizers against one another uh, to make sure that they're working in your favor and not against you. So yeah, it definitely keeps me going. I, I, I truly enjoy these talents. Well, and, and you were, I think when we actually met in person, you were walking me through how you lit up. Um, there's this, I'm, I'm on your Instagram account actually right now. There's a post that you made on March 5th of mm-hmm. uh, a Budweiser black lager bottle. Yeah. And you, yeah. were, you were talking about how you got that, that gold light on the, right. on, on the bottle. And, and there's this whole process. And you're like, how do you do that? And then you went and f- figured it out. And it's just a stunning image. And then you show well, your lighting setup right next to it too. It's really cool. 
Yeah, I, 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 you know, you get a lot of questions about how is this being done, and yeah. in particularly that shot because I only used one light um, for that shot. Uh, and this is what I call a limiting challenge, where I year after year I create some sort of challenge, whether it's with you know, a, a older camera or a film camera in one lens, or in this case, I used one light uh, to light something that I would probably use two to three lights to get the shot. Hmm. So these limiting limiting challenges help me really explore how certain pieces of equipment, or in this case, how this one light in this position yeah. is, you know, creating, uh, you know, that lighting situation or an effect for the subject that I'm using. But coupled with that, yeah, uh, you know, one light and a host of gold cards to really uh, bring out that gold foiling in the paper, you know, just making that pop, you know, again, brands spend a lot of money on labeling and that's their brand. That's their, that's their call to action, right? That's, you know, that's what attracts people to a certain brand is, is sometimes that, that labeling or that graphic. Sure. Uh, and it's our job to highlight that. Wow. Well, and you did a beautiful job of that. So for everybody <laughs> listening in, you got to go check out George's work. Uh, if you go to gmitchellphoto.com and then same thing on Instagram, and of course we'll link to this in the show notes, but yeah, I, I see your post pop up and I'm, it, it just, there's, they're so vivid and, and in many cases very warm and it just draws you in and you want that drink. Like there's this picture on the homepage of your site right now. I, I it may just be whiskey or maybe an old fashioned yeah. or, or something like that. Eat whatever it is. I'm like, yeah, I'll have one of those. Right. <laughs> so right, right. Be- beautiful job and uh, well, ma- major props to what you're doing. But Let's talk about brand position. This is something we spend a lot of time on here on the podcast. Uh, I mean, on the homepage of your site, you say food, beverage, people, which, I mean, mm-hmm. frankly, it, it covers kind of a wide gamut, right, of, of yes. these segments of the industry. So how do you stand out amidst tackling all three of those segments? You know, that's a good question. Um, you know, really, uh, for me, it's it's about having your own style. It's about having uh, that unique approach to uh, those individual um, areas right? okay. and offering something different in your approach in those areas. Um, so, with you know, for me, that's where I started was with with people. You know, my my apprenticeship was done under a, a wedding and event photographer. Right. I just wanted to learn how to use the camera and he had a whole different idea for me. Right. And that's how I was able to learn lighting. Um, I was able to learn posing people and uh, lighting techniques and interacting with with clients. Yeah, I learned yeah. all that during my apprenticeship. And okay. I, I carried that with me all the way through uh, photographing. You know, I moved on to doing my own weddings and doing events. Uh, I still do events to this day, uh, not just personally, but for a, a corporation. Okay. But I, I, I took all those things that I learned and I also brought them into the beverage and the food arena with me hmm. uh, because there is something to be taken from. Uh, from each arena of photography, I don't care what it is that you do, there's something that you learn there that can always be carried over into the next area. Um, so, yeah, so offering, you know, I, and I really felt that that helped craft my style and helped make me unique in certain uh, certain areas. So when it came to people, when it came to food and beverage, my background and in, in growing in photography and learning more about photography as I was growing really, really helped me shave out a niche for myself and create a style that was my own. Hmm. You know, when you think about, like, for instance, there are a ton of photographers that we look up to, but there were some that stood out to me because of their style. And I really embraced their style, which was kind of moody, dark and shadowy in some instances. Sure. Uh, so all these things really helped me create my style, which really helps, you know, me kind of define a lane in each individual individual area. So I'm curious in your take on this, you know, we, we talk about style as photographers and it's something that we understand. And because we have critical eyes or more critical eyes than our typical client does, where we know what it means to see the difference in, in various photographic styles. How do you effectively communicate that though to a potential client? Is, is that something that's, that's challenging? Do they just see it and they come to you because they, they actually see that style and it stands out to them? I know doing commercial work in particular, it's not the same as portrait and wedding photography, for example. But what's, what's your experience with this? Well, you know, I would say that that's exactly it. I think people book you. They look to hire you because there's something in your work that they see that they like 
what you're you're already doing. You know, we get a lot of people that uh, as photographers, we get a lot of people who <laughs> who contact us to recreate something else that they've seen. But I would say the majority of, of, of my customers, uh, they contact me because they're looking for me to recreate something that I'm already doing, but for them. OK. Um, and I think that's. You know that's the driver there, right? They're they're looking at my style, they're looking at what I do, and they're they're liking what I do. So that's what's attracting them to me. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, again, props to you because your your work does it, it's very striking. It really stands out, and <laughs> I appreciate um, it. I'm not surprised that you're continuing to get work when when people see that. So, but Thank you. you mentioned learning how to interact with clients mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. your experience mm -hmm. as a business owner. What has has your experience been when it comes to figuring out how to provide the best possible experience? Is there a particular principle that's made a really big impact? Yeah, there are, there, there are actually four for me. Okay. Um, you know, flexibility, hmm. the ups and downs in the economy. There are a ton of different things that, that affect us as people, right? So you have to be flexible. Um, but that's one. Timely communication. Mm, um, yeah. You know, early on, I had a few instances, and I'll be honest, where communication wasn't timely. I've read studies by some of the professional photography groups that talks about the photographers being great photographers and artists, yeah. right, and creatives, but not having the business savvy for communication. Um, so reading those things helped me understand that, you know, communication is king, right? Uh, but timely communication is even better. Mm. Um, exceeding deadline, quick turnarounds, but, yeah. you know, uh, importantly, having a detailed plan of execution, you know, especially when we're talking about commercial work, really, when you're talking about any photography work, no one likes to be nickel and dimed and no one wants to come back to the table to learn that we need to spend more money in order to get this look. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, me being having a, a, a background in project management, it really allows me the, uh, the opportunity for my photography clients to build a detailed plan of execution. Uh, this way, we're making sure that we're hitting all the points and we're agreeable uh, in what those points are and what the final outcome should be before we get to the <laughs> the end of the image uh, and we're in, you know we're looking to submit those images for as final and something's amiss so those would be the, the the things that I would definitely say would be as a business owner you would definitely want to you know, have, you know, some sort of handle on. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So flexibility, timely communication, timely delivery, and then a detailed plan of execution. And I love that the reminder uh, of the significance of details and planning ahead. This is not something that I think that most photographers, artist types tend to do, uh, myself mm -hmm. included, by the way. Uh, I just, I, I, I see the big picture and I'm really excited about this thing that's going to happen. But the idea of planning the details out ahead of time, just not my tendency. And, and so mm -hmm. it's good to be reminded of the significance of that. But I wanted to go back to flexibility. The first point that you made, when you talk about being flexible, especially in this kind of volatile market that we're in at the moment, what does that mean for you? Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, I, I do a lot of work, especially now that I'm between Michigan and St. Louis, I'm back and forth. You know, I do a lot of work for uh, or with, I should say, small business owners, right? This level of photography that I offer, you wouldn't normally be able to get as a small business. And I found that that was definitely a niche for me to be able to, to work with small business owners um, and provide them a... Uh, an image or a series of images that was consistent, that, that definitely told the story of their brand and, and their product, but more importantly, that allowed them to compete along the same lines as maybe some of the big box competitors, hmm. right? So with that, you know, you have to be flexible. Like we all have to eat, right? So you have to keep your pricing um, at a certain, you know, a, a certain level, if yeah. you will, you know, you, you're, you're, it's your business, right? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I've had clients that were like, hey, listen, we really love your work and we're really looking to do this, but it's just a little bit out of our price range. Hmm. There's nothing wrong with offering, a, uh, you know, a payment plan for those customers. Right. You know, so flexibility there, but also understanding that, you know, life comes into play for some others, right? So being flexible with meetings, you know, at one point in time, it was, it was mandatory to meet with me in, per in person, Right? Because I wanted to show you printed samples and I wanted to show you these things because I wanted you to see that my work looks just as good on screen as it does in print, <laughs> sure. you know, especially for restaurants, because, yeah. you know, 
they're getting ready to maybe do a menu or whatever the case may be. But I wanted them to see this. But now, I mean, especially now, right, under the, today's climate, you know, there's nothing wrong with being flexible to meet with that uh, that mom that may be, you know, with the kids or that parent that may be with the kids and unable to actually uh, be in a meeting. But also for the person that's in the office that's in a different city. You know, I, I get calls from Michigan still when I'm in St. Louis and vice versa, asking for meetings. And sometimes you just can't be there. So you have to be flexible. Uh, and you also have to find ways and be creative in finding ways of meeting a client's expectation when sometimes it may be a little bit against the grain of what you're doing or what your processes normally are as sure. a photographer. That makes sense. I mean, it, it seems like all of this kind of can fall under the umbrella of setting our ego aside for a bit and, and exactly. being willing to be open to what the client might need in the moment. Um, right. And I, I, to be clear, for everybody listening in, I understand the significance, too, of, of setting a certain standard and maintaining that at least the majority of the time, especially as it represents your brand. But um, I, I do like the reminder, George, that sometimes we, we can it's OK to set some of that stuff aside for the sake of making sure that we Agreed. serve our clients. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Good stuff. Um, talk to me about time, actually. And, and I know that we have more time than the normal at the moment. But <laughs> on during so-called normal times, do you have difficulty creating time for yourself for the important people in your life despite running a photography business? Or have you figured out a way to kind of balance both those things? You know what? I had to figure out a way to balance things. So having a photography business, being a photographer and project manager for a Fortune 500 company, um, <laughs> and, you know, you couple travel with that, you have to manage the time. You mm -hmm. have to carve out time for yourself. You yeah. have to have that time to to decompress. You know, I did maybe 50,000 miles last year. Wow. Flights between you know personal travel and a large majority of that was with uh with work with the day job as as a photographer um so there's the home there's the personal photography business and i remember you know getting off of the plane and turning on the phone and i've gotten uh you know a request through my uh, customer relationship management tool for someone who's interested in 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 talking to me about their product or, or their food or, or, you know, whatever they're looking to have done photography wise. Sure. Uh, and again, it goes back to the timely communication, right? So these things, they can, they can really overwhelm you and, and be a lot to consume. Sure. Uh, so I, I use calendars. Um, I've integrated all the ones that I could. Uh, there are some that can't be integrated with other things because of security settings on, on those calendars, but I definitely carve out time uh, for personal things, for family, for personal travel, you know, because I find that when you take that personal time and you're able to really decompress and not touch a camera or not be, you know, but behind the, 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 the screen at an editing table, whatever the case may be, it really helps me uh, to, to be a lot more clear. Right. Yeah. Uh, taking vacations is important. That whole idea of of uh, unplugging, if you will, that's important to 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 me as a creative is important uh, because it allows me that time to kind of refresh. Right. And, and to catch up on things like sleep or <laughs> yeah. uh, those needed interactions and conversations with friends and family. So scheduling has been a lifesaver for me. And there are just dates on my calendar that that cannot be altered. Uh, and again, you know, yeah, we want to be flexible. Uh, flexibility has to be on both sides of the coin. Right. Sure. It, it can't just be you that's always being flexible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I've been told that I'm persuasive. So I, I have <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty good. At, at talking. So, you know, I'm always willing to communicate, you know, the alternatives and seeing if, you know, what works best for, for everyone. So scheduling and sticking to the schedule uh, as best you can um, to carve out that time is important. It's so important. Well, and you talked about consolidation of calendars. That really can make a big difference too. I mean, I even share Definitely. a calendar, at, at least two calendars, I guess, with my kids. Um, mm -hmm, I'm a single mm -hmm. dad and I'm, and they're busy and I'm busy. And, and so coordinating everything that we have going on on a day-to-day -day basis even can just make a big difference when we're all on the same page with 
what's going on in the calendar. Exactly. And that it, it seems kind of simple and maybe obvious, but the reality is I don't know that we're all necessarily leveraging that tool as consistently as we should. So it, it's a good reminder for sure to leverage that technology. It's there, it's available. We need to take advantage exactly. and, and be proactive in planning. I think that's great. But you know, delegation or outsourcing is another component of time management. Of course, this podcast is sponsored by Photographers Edit, so we're huge fans of the idea of delegation mm-hmm. or outsourcing. Mm-hmm. But um, what what have you found, if it, if anything at all, um, what kind of benefit have you found through delegation delegating work in your business? Well, you know, when you're a small business owner, you're always looking for more time, sure. right? Yeah. More time to promote yourself, more time to, to get your message and your brand out there. Um, and one of the things that I, I have found to be a, a huge help, especially with with food and beverage, I, the, the way I approach food and beverage, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's a little bit different from others. You know, I do multiple shots of, of beverages, especially when it comes to the product of beverage, uh, but even food. Uh, I'll, I'll photograph maybe, you know, two or three shots of, of a dish um, because I'm focusing on those, you know, those key uh, pieces of that dish. And I'm going to composite those later uh, to build one solid image. And that takes a lot of time to go through the compositing and, and color correction and things of that sort. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I start that process, but I, you know, I have gotten to the point to where I have given up the control. Right. <laughs> and, and I've, I've, I've used, I've used photographers edits for a, uh, a beverage ad that I was just struggling to to get right, right? Um, and I sent it over, and they knocked it out. And I know that it's not, you know, a, a big thing of for them to do product work, their photographers at it, but they did an awesome job. So, cool. I mean, you're dealing with a talented retoucher, right? But, you know, I, I have a, a series of retouchers that I, w- I will relinquish the work to because I need to get that time back. Yeah. So I can focus on developing the, you know, the next... Because I still do storyboarding. So, you know, working on the next storyboard of how I'm going to get this crazy idea of <laughs> pouring, you know, how to capture a pouring beverage into a glass or yeah. or a splash, or whatever the case may be, or to talk with uh, the next potential customer or to get that time back to just focus on the next thing that will get me in front of the next person uh, or the next big opportunity. Yeah. Right? Uh, I find that, you know, Social media can also be another drain on your time. Um, so I'm looking at, you know, possibly getting someone to assist in that area because, mm. of course, especially now, I mean, that's how we're communicating with our clients or potential clients is through social media. And the one thing that they're looking for is consistency, right? So, you know, what better way to be consistent is to have someone who can come in and who can manage that 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 aspect for you in keeping a consistent message and keeping you out of trouble, <laughs> you know, <laughs> keep you from posting something that you may not need to post. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, those two items would be huge for me because now it allows me that opportunity to really, really sit down and focus on moving to the next um, versus being bogged down with, you know, being behind a computer or, or posting, you know, trying to maintain a, that, that consistent message. Well, first of all, I appreciate the, the shout out to photographers. Ed. I didn't expect that and wasn't planning on it, but I, I appreciate the <laughs> kind words. Um, but I'm glad that you highlight the significance too of, of how delegation ultimately frees you up to, to do other things, to focus on other things. And, yes. and I think that's really the big message behind that is if we're willing, and it's not just about editing, if we're willing to delegate work in our business that doesn't absolutely require our involvement, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. it frees us up to, to have a life, a personal life, but also frees us up to do things that, that will too. actually help build our business. And that's Correct. really, really important to remember. So I, I love that you highlight that. Talk to me about inspiration. Actually, this is I'm kind of curious about this, particularly from you, George. It, it, are you finding sources of inspiration outside the photography industry that, that ultimately get you excited to then go back to work? What is that like for you? <laughs> well, Nathan, I, you know, I, uh, I hang out in liquor stores. <laughs> <laughs> I hang out in grocery stores. Yeah. You know, I hang out in Pier One, Crate and Barrel. Okay. I spend a lot of time online. Um, I look at past images, you know, I follow other food and beverage photographers and people photographers online. When, when me and my fiance go out to dinner, I'm looking around and she, 
she gets it. She understands. So, you know, I try not to, to gaze off uh, too much into the, <laughs> to the ambiance of the restaurant and pay her attention. <laughs> but, um, but no, yeah, I, 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 I find inspiration in all of those things, you know, they, and to be quite honest and, and serious, I will go to the liquor store. If I feel the need to be challenged and I want to, I want to find this peculiar bottle or yeah. this amazing label, sure. you know, I'll, I'll visit the liquor store and I'll walk around and I'll talk to the reps in the store to figure out, you know, more about the brand and where I can find more about the different cocktails that can be mixed using mm. that particular beverage. Okay. Um, you know, same thing with food. Um, you know, I, I did a, a cine twist um image a while back and i was simply walking through one of the markets and in these cinnamon twists were were there in the case and i was like wow those look delicious and they were flaky <laughs> and yeah and i bought them and i took them home and i you know photographed them and then i put them on the counter and never ate them i just <laughs> you know so yeah i do find um uh, inspiration outside of that pretty much in, in everywhere that i go and the things that i do there's always something that's going to stand out even things as, as minute as as um, a script or a font mm. that you may find yep. in, you know, like, you know, I'm a real big fan of like the old school, like pub fonts or, yeah. um, you know, fonts that you might find on some of the tattoo parlors now. Yep. They, they send a whole nother message, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it creates that, that inspiration for me sometimes that I'm like, okay, I need to create this shot. And I'm going to kind of go, go with this thing. So I'll start build, I'll take pictures with my phone and start building kind of like a storyboard of how I want this final image to look so yeah inspiration is all around us so, so i definitely look to to you know find that inspiration and in everywhere everywhere that i go and things that i do to to bring back to the images that i develop see i'd be in trouble though because i'd be eating the ins the so-called inspiration <laughs> like I, I found this shot of those cinnamon twists and we'll, we'll try to put it in the show notes but from july 7 2017 is is the yeah. instagram post and my word I, I don't i've never seen a cinnamon twist with layers in the in the pastry itself that is amazing right. yeah exactly so i mean those things capture because it's like okay i can use this technique to really bring that out yeah and i believe that i believe that one image was like maybe four different shots because i was actually focusing in on some of those areas where there was you know like you said those layers or those flakes yeah. or you know then of course there was the uh, the pouring of the uh the creamer in the coffee mug and things of that sort right so when you're seeing these things in the case you're like oh i can do all these different things with this one you know pastry or this one object or this one bottle or glass uh same thing in crate and barrel i'll go in there and i'll I'll see a tray or I'll see something that will just just jog this idea of, you know, how to create a shot or what, you know, a type of shot I want to create. So definitely. Oh, man. Well, uh, we'll we'll try to we'll try to get that picture in the show notes for everybody who's curious. Um, I think F Stoppers <laughs> even gave you a, a pretty big shout out too back in the day after you yeah, yeah. taking that shot just for that picture. Everybody's probably drooling looking at the image, but um, <laughs> that's pretty incredible stuff. Hey, talk to me about um, a book. We we talk a lot about books here on the podcast, self help books, business books, or maybe something else, maybe even a podcast that you've found impactful in some form or fashion. What comes to mind? Oh man, wow! You know. Um there are several things across mediums. I, I just started within the last couple of years with the podcast, you know, so of course the Boca podcast, shout out to, to you guys. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, Photo Spark, Pro EDU, those podcasts, okay. uh, you know, um, oh man, it's just uh, Planet Money, NPR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the nod. I mean, there are just so many different podcasts where you can, you can really catch up with, uh, you know, people that are doing some really amazing, cool things. And, uh, business wars is another one Okay. Um, where, you know, I'll, I'll listen in to learn, you know, I, I do a lot of equating to the dollar menu, something that I picked up from business wars. Right. So yeah, the podcasts are a, a great inspiration and tool for me to, to kind of stay abreast with certain things. When we talk about books, again, you know, I've always had a camera in my hand from a very, very young boy. My dad kept cameras. He had a ton of cameras. Oh, he still cool. has them. Yeah. And the first camera I ever shot, he actually gifted to me a few years ago. 
um, and I have it in front of me now. It's a Yashica A twin yes. Rolex camera. Yeah, man. And he, you know, he through high school, through college, he, you know, do you have your camera? Do you have your camera? If I was going on a road trip, do you have your camera? But I never, you know, I, I never took a photography course. I never learned about the inner workings of cameras and, mm. and things of that sort. Becoming a photographer, it was just something I always did. Um, so I met a gentleman who's no longer with us, unfortunately, Al Alderman, uh, at a PPA conference, Imaging USA, a few years ago. Okay. He has a book uh, called Road to Certification that, that they use for their certification process. And I, I bought that book because I wanted to learn more about photography. I just didn't want to be the person that takes a great picture. I really wanted to understand why it was working the way that it, it works. And mm -hmm. I still read. I, I'll refer to that book from time to time. Photography 101 was another book that I've, I've, I've dove into to, to really understand this thing of photography. I just not having any formal education. Case and I just thought it was important that I needed to read a little bit more. And now I'm reading a book on food styling. Oh, really? Right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I struggle. <laughs> I struggle with food styling so bad, but um, I, I, I try. I try. And again, I bought the book because I really, really wanted to better understand what this thing of food styling is. Um, so yeah, there are there are a series of things, whether it be podcasts or tutorials or books that, that have really helped me get to where I am today. Of course, the people, but these things are, are definitely keepsakes that I keep around that yeah. I can always refer back to. Well, we'll link to, to some of these resources in the show notes as well. For anybody listening in, make sure to, to take advantage of the show notes. If you just go to bocapodcast.com, look at the episode underneath the episode, Haley puts together show notes. Um, links to the resources that we talk about, the talking points from the conversation. Um, you can take advantage of those at bocapodcast.com. So make sure to check those out. And, and by the way, the, the Yashica A, I actually have a Yashica D, a twin lens oh, wow. camera as well. And in okay. fact, I just recently took it out and, and shot some portraits with it. I love that camera. It is It is so <laughs> much fun to use. And it really kind of it makes you take a step back, take a breath and, and think through the right. whole process because everything is completely manual. I love that. Yes, exactly. Yep, another limiting exercise just to help you get back to the to the norms of things, right? Hundred so, percent. Yeah, I agree. Well, I, I want to kind of move George into our primary topic for for the yeah. day, which um, I guess if we were just to keep a really simple summation or title for it, would be about encouraging diversity in the photography industry and. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, I, I want to say that I have a lot of respect for you in the way that we, you even approached this conversation initially when we were at, in Vegas. You know, I mean, it, it's obviously a sensitive topic, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. a lot of people, myself included, at times, kind of a tendency of you know tiptoeing around and not really getting into conversation in a deep way where something can get accomplished because of various apprehensions. Um, right. but you just you made it so easy. I mean, you're easy to talk to. Um, well, thank you. you're just a fun loving guy and, and, and that shows right <laughs> away. And honestly, that that's, I mean, I, I just love that from an individual in general, but especially mm -hmm. when we're approaching a topic that could potentially be sensitive or is sensitive, you just made it easy to go there. So I, I want to say that I just have respect for you in that regard, but well, thank you. Will, will you just kind of share where you're coming from on this topic of diversity, specifically in regards to the photography industry is, is I guess our current state is right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to your point, I, I don't think it should be a sensitive topic because it's I think there's a, a level of confusion when you hear the word. And, and we, we, we actually dug, dug into this uh, during our meeting. Right. Yeah. We talked about really defining things for what they are. Well, and can you and, touch on that for a second? Because I, I think it's a really important topic. When you mentioned the term diversity, you know, some people automatically assume that this is a black thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And when you really look at what diversity is, it's not. It's an all-inclusive thing. Yeah. We need everybody to play a, play a role in diversity, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the real conversation is, is more so about inclusion. Okay. It, it, you know, it's, you know it's, it's about being included, right? Um, and I'll give you a story. So 2013, I believe it was my first professional photography conference, and uh, I was invited to come and and check out the conference. So I, you know, booked a ticket, flew down, and nobody there looked like me at all. Hmm. Right. And I shouldn't say nobody, but there were very few African American African Americans and even fewer 
African American male. Sure. But you know, I grew up in in Catholic school. I grew up in 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 different you know parts of of uh, Michigan. So I've always had friends from a diverse background. Sure. Right. So. Initially, it, it came as a shock, right? Because you're like, okay, well, nobody looks like me, but I'm here to better myself and to learn during this 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 conference. I need to do that. And I befriended a photographer, a young white woman, um, and she took me around and she introduced me to everyone. Wow. Right. You know, it, it's not. It's, it's just not a black thing. It's just it's one of those things where you when you walk into a place, you feel comforted. Of some of us feel comforted um, seeing people that they know or yeah. seeing people that they can identify sure. with, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not everybody's going to, uh, you know, have the ease or be at ease with intermingling with others. And that's, I think that's where we have to start. You know, why are those apprehensions there in the first place, right? Well, I, I, love, th- I love that you differentiate between inclusion and diversity because I think part of the issue, and this is where you, you, you mentioned, you alluded to, uh, definitions that we kind of got into in our conversation in Vegas. Mm-hmm. I, I think maybe one of the reasons that there is apprehension even approaching this topic of diversity is the word racism comes up, and exactly. and the there's maybe an assumption that if we're suggesting somebody needs to be more diverse or a, an organization, a group needs to be more diverse, we're we're automatically pointing fingers and saying that they're being racist, and that may be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. Correct. Right. Exactly. And again, it goes back to those apprehensions. Right. And, you know, we have to explore those apprehensions and, or, or biases. They could even be, you know, biases. Sure, you know, we yeah. have to explore those biases. And a lot of times bias can be unconscious. Right. Um, you know, sometimes we have a bias to, uh, that we're just unaware of. Right. I, I took a, a implicit bias exam and there were some things revealed in that exam. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> like really me yeah. you know me that's open to everybody and hangs out with everybody right no you know it's sometimes this, these things are just in your subconscious and yeah. you you don't realize it until you're called out on it and to your point yeah you know sometimes it when people feel like they could be labeled of course that creates the apprehension but again we need to address these apprehensions and why they exist hmm. right but I think we have to also def- define things for really what they are and not what people perceive them to be. So, again, when I speak to diversity, you know, it's it's everybody playing along fairly. And then, you know, it's really about inclusion, you know. Yeah. Um, that inclusion piece is that identification piece. I can identify with you because we have something similar. And if we're only looking at the surface – you can't get beneath it to really figure out those similarities. So you, some of us immediately turn off. I could have easily turned off at that conference and just hung out and did other things and maybe hung out on the expo floor. But no, I decided to engage and, and really talk to people and get to know hmm. their experiences. And I think, I think that's when we start to learn that we're not that much different. We've had similar experiences, maybe some things in different ways. But I think that conversation helps open the door to being included. Well, and I think it's a, it's a, almost like a um, a softer approach to the conversation about on a grander scale diversity and on a grand even more grand scale um, the potential of racism because when we're talking about included. Everybody wants to feel included regardless of of race, right? I mean, I can right. walk into a conference that's majority white photographers, female or male, and I mean, just the simple reality of of social constructs as they are most of those people still don't engage with me despite the fact that I look like them. A lot of people are just, they're shy or they're mm-hmm. egotistical or they're you know selfish in some way, whatever the reason, they're just simply right. not engaging. So at the end of the day, when we're talking about inclusion, I think, I think it's a, it's a softer sell at the very least for somebody who's like, wait a minute, you're saying I should be more diverse. Are you, are you suggesting I'm racist? Right. We're, not, we're not even, we're not even going there. We're just simply right, saying we're not going there. on a very right. basic level, let's make sure that everybody actually feels included, including those who may not look the same as you. Let's just, right. and, and, and you, I love the example that you gave of this, this woman who made the effort to actually take you around and, and engage you in the conference, introduce you to people, help you feel included in that regard. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, when we talk about experiences, right, when we, I think a lot of times people look at different experiences 
uh, or they don't look at different experiences, right? I look at each individual's experience as data, right? Hmm. And and not data in a bad way, but I think it's 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 data that can be used to really help hurdle o- obstacles, right? Um, so let's look at it from a from a, a corporation or a business standpoint. Okay, when you you know. Statistics show that that businesses that are truly diverse at all levels typically do 30 to 35 percent better than their competitors. And I would attribute that to you having that data from those individuals in that organization that could speak to those audiences uh, a little bit more clearly. Right. They speak the language. They walk the walk. Yeah. Um, and therefore, your message is a lot clearer mm. when it's reaching those audiences. Interesting. Yeah. Wider range of perspectives, not just limited exactly. to this particular perspective or that particular exactly. perspective. Yeah. So when we're looking at incidents in particular, like, um, you know, I don't want to call out any names, but when we're looking at racial instance, uh, insensitivity yeah. and incidents with uh, with clothing lines over the past years. Sure. Um, if those offices were a little bit more diverse, maybe there wouldn't have been those incidents Certainly. in, in yeah. the beginning. Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, maybe the me- the message would be a lot different. It, it could definitely be a lot clearer uh, in reaching those audiences. So the diversity is about everyone playing together. But also, you know, it, again, it's about it's collecting that data of experiences to make sure that as a protection, and as a promotion, if you want to look at it that way, right? So having a diverse group around you can only broaden your perspectives, in yeah. my opinion. Oh, 100%. Um, and I've mentioned this in the podcast a number of times before, but I had the, the privilege of growing up in a whole different country. So I grew up in Japan. Right. Um, and it, I was actually in kind of the, the southern portion, actually a very southern portion of Japan, out in the country, uh, where as they would refer to them as gaijin, the foreigners, there, there aren't very many foreigners. So I was, I was the, the odd man out, if you will. I was the one right. who, you know, they were asking for a piece of my hair because I was blonde and nobody else has blonde mm. hair. And, um, and, and there were some of that obviously becomes enjoyable because you're singled out because you almost become a, a celebrity. And then the flip side of that <laughs> is, and I experienced this more as, as I grew up and became a teenager and I was playing soccer with the, the local soccer team. Uh, you then more easily become the, the kind of the brunt of, uh, shall we say, well, just being made fun of, uh, very yeah. simply, because, again, mm-hmm. you're the one that stands out. So I've experienced right. being in a culture where, you know, that there are positive experience and, and where I'm, first of all, I'm different, but I'm, I have positive experiences and I have some experiences that aren't so great. Um, nonetheless, my perspective is broadened as a result of being exposed to a very a drastically different culture. And I, I'm so thankful for that opportunity. I've had the opportunity to visit other countries as well. But nonetheless, an open-mindedness to other perspectives, um, it, it's so vital because otherwise our ego just kind of tends to, to force us in this, this narrow-minded direction. We have blinders on. We assume that what we know is just the way to go, and that's right. that. And and assum- I mentioned assume, but I think assumptions, that, that, that word is a key word in this whole conversation. Assumptions are made constantly. Somebody may awesome. not actually think less of somebody else because of the race than they, but they make assumptions that mm-hmm. result in mm-hmm. significant insensi- insensitivities and ultimately mm-hmm. poor treatment, and, and those need to be addressed. So these, this idea that we limit our perspective results in poor assumptions, which results in poor treatment of, of other people. And we need to be open-minded to, to broadening our perspective and welcoming those other perspectives in, and that'll help improve the way that we engage with other people as a whole. Uh, well said and agreed, agreed. And I think, you know, again, when, you know, when we get to the point to where we can, you know, we sit down and we start learning from one another, that's when things get better. You know, when we when we lean on the assumptions and when we we lean on our biases. I think that's when we start. That's when we cater to those issues that that we've that we've constantly had. So I I, I agree with your perspective. I, I I totally do. Well, and and I mean I. I'm nothing if not naive. Uh, I, I'm I'm that guy who's like, let's all get along and and you know be one big community. And and yet I know that I have so much to learn. And and thanks to 
individuals like yourself who are willing to have conversations, my perspective continues to broaden because I know I have, I have a lot to learn. And, and the last thing that I want is for my ignorance to play a role and, and, and somehow being insensitive in conversation to somebody of a different race or culture or perspective or, or whatever the case may be. But to kind of bring it back to the photography industry, I'd love yeah. for you to kind of give us a, a summation maybe from your perspective of where you see our industry at, uh, currently with regards to this idea of inclusion. Um, I mean, I, I, it seems as though there has been at least a little bit of progress made in the last year or two even, um, but right. but yet there's there's plenty of room for improvement too. So can you kind of share both sides, the, the good and the bad that you're seeing? Yeah, well, I, I feel like we all have work to do, but I, I honestly think that it has gotten better. I know for a fact that Professional Photographers of America, as well as WPPI, have uh, committees that are that are addressing the concern, right? But again, we need everyone at the table. Mm. of all nationalities you yeah, know yeah. Uh, we need to you know we need people that there are there are some amazing photographers in all walks of life um but we need those individuals to step up you know we need those individuals to uh to be present if you will so you know we're having these discussions and i have seen a a, a drastic improvement and um you know speaker selection committees right yeah, yeah. um i think my first one of my first conferences, there was one African American that entire three days or whatever it was speaking on the stage. And again, you know, we're talking about identifying with someone. Right. And people just want to feel represented. Right. 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 Um, we're even in brands, you know, we're seeing brands now that include, you know, minorities from all walks, whether it be women or or African American, whomever, we're starting to see that, you know, things are, are opening up and there's truly a, a diverse pool. And, and I I think it's getting better, slowly but surely. But I think the more that we have these conversations, the more doors and opportunities will open um, because, you know, again, biases are there. Um, and sometimes we make assumptions, to your point. Yes. We make assumptions and we don't think it's a problem when it actually is. And, and until we have those conversations, uh, people like yourself and others, people really start to understand that, okay, well, maybe this is an issue that we need to address and, and, and maybe open the door a little bit to give those opportunities. And again, being inclusive. Well, it, it seems as though really the biggest move the industry has made, just if I can speak kind of generally, is that conversations have at least begun. Right. Um, you're, you're right, right that the the speaker lineups have begun to shift as well. And, and I'm, I'm glad to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least conversations have begun. I hope that you know this. Even this conversation today, as it goes out to the industry, is a catalyst of sorts for encouraging further conversation, um, helping create some awareness of the fact that conversations like this can be had. Assuming, you know, I, I think it, we, it's funny how how much assumption plays a role in so many different areas of this particular conversation. But you know, even the idea that if I'm going to sit down and have a conversation with somebody who is of a different race than I am. If if we if I can go into that conversation assuming that the other person has my best interests at heart, uh, and vice versa, it sets mm -hmm. the stage for a lot more comfortable conversation. But I think a lot of times the assumption is, even if it's subconscious, as you alluded to earlier, that it's kind of like me versus you, right, uh, versus right. us trying to sit down and work together as a right. team. You mean you're talking about learning to play together? Um, <laughs> that 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 would be the ultimate goal, right? And right, and and yet. Right. There, we don't always sit down in conversation with that that approach or that mentality. I don't think, and so as you said earlier, there's there's natural apprehension because mm -hmm. there is fear that the other person doesn't have your best interests at heart. So, right. I, again, I'm right. I, I'm nothing if not naive, but I like to think that if we sit down and we're trying to work together, that that we start in that place, and that makes room to have conversations without being afraid of somehow coming off the wrong way. Right, exactly. And and of course, no one wants to walk into a, a combative situation, right? You know, but yeah, I would I, I love to see these conversations happening. I love to see the um the people who are coming to the table to have them and, and to share the the you know, the ideas that are coming from these conversations and, and you know, in some situations, there are some actionable items. Yes. Yeah. Well, you actually mentioned, you mentioned to me before we started recording that there were kind of three suggestions that you had that maybe specific ways that our industry could actually help improve this inclusion that we're talking about. Can you share those with our listeners? Uh, so, you know, 
those would be things more representation and brands we're we're seeing that you know whether okay. it's you know speakers on the stage or you know i don't care lighting equipment you know we're seeing that because of course that will draw that audience right these tribes if you will more demographic investment you know a lot of times you know people say well i just don't know where to find this particular person from this particular group to even be on a stage or to represent our brand or whatever the case may be. Hmm. But, you know, we have to do, we have to dig in, we have to, to look for these people. And I know a lot of times things are by referral, you know, because sure. as we know, sometimes it's who, you know, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if, if your inner circle doesn't look like my inner circle, then, you know, you continuously get the same people recycled for these different opportunities. And, and our industry is so bad about that. I mean, you, you <laughs> con- I mean, and I've been in the industry for close to 20 years now, and I'm still seeing some of the same speakers, you know, headlining right. a stage that I was almost 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, or whatever it was. And, it- you know, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but the thing with that is, is now, you know, are you opening the door for the next person? Right. 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 Um, and, and, yeah, like I said, if my inner circle doesn't look like your inner circle, you're opening the door for, you know, you're opening that opportunity to recycle some of these same people. But sometimes it's it's about taking notice of someone who isn't in your inner circle mm. and and really, you know, recognizing their talent because we're not we're not talking about giving people the opportunity to do things just because they're of a specific uh, race or ethnic uh, ethnicity. Sure. We're talking about looking at people who who truly, I mean, I know a, a ton of talented photographers and I'm like, wow, wow. Like I'm learning from them as well. And yes. I'm like, I can't see why others aren't seeing what you're, what you're doing. Yes. Right. Um, which would lead me to my last point, which is inclusion and reaching outside of the normal talent pool. I mean, there are, there are some really, really awesome photographers that I follow, uh, you know, like the Kesha Lamberts of the world, the oh, Dallas word, Logans, yeah. the, the Kimberly Lees, um, um, you know, George DeLoach, somebody I've gotten to know over the years, amazing. His lighting is just, it's its amazing. You know, Kimberly Lee, you know, she does food and beverage photography uh, in Toronto, Canada. Mm. You know, just, just good work, you know, and I'm like, you know, and maybe these individuals don't, you know, Maybe they're not looking to get on a stage or, or, or to do those things, but you would still think that, you know, they would become at some point, they may become the common household name from some of their other talented works. Right. Um, but yeah, that would be the, my last point is just, you know, inclusion in, in looking outside of the normal talent pool to bring those people in to, because there's an opportunity to learn from these individuals. And I think that's what's most important. I think if we're going to keep the industry thriving and growing, we definitely have to bring in different perspectives. Yeah. And that's the one way of doing it. Oh, for sure. And, and by the way, you mentioned Kesha earlier. Kesha was on the podcast back in episode 272. So for anybody listening in, if, if you haven't heard that episode, we'll make sure to put that in the show notes too at bocapodcast.com. But what, one of the experiences that I've had, George, that's been pretty cool doing this podcast, and this is going to be episode... Uh, something like four twelve or four thirteen, something like that. We've done a, nice. we've had a br- large number of guests on, and you know, we I very purposely have brought guests on from from kind of all over the industry because our industry is really bad about having like the same fifty names all over the place. You go to a podcast, you go to a trade show, you go to a conference, and you're always seeing the same names. So it's been really cool to have a wide variety of photographers on. And I start to research the guests as they're coming on. And, and sometimes I do the very thing that you were talking about. It's like, how in the world does nobody know about this <laughs> right. photographer? Right. Um, it, that, like nobody's talking. They're just back there doing their thing, getting the work done, you know, running a great business or whatever. It, talented photographers. You, you just don't know because they keep recycling the same photographers over and over again. So right. your point is well taken. And I think there's wonderful, wonderful opportunity to, to learn from such. I mean, we have thousands and thousands of photographers out there. Yes. It's just kind of weird that we keep hearing from the same 50 all the time and, and not to minimize their talent, but there's no. there are just so many more people out there. So I'm, I'm glad that you highlight that just as, right. as we close here. And I know we could speak for hours and, and I hope that, that we do get a chance actually to have you back on again so that we can continue this conversation. But yeah. um, I, I really, I, I think it's important, you know, it's one thing for us to kind of shoot 
our ideas back and forth, and even just to make some some simple simple suggestions as to kind of next steps, next actions that we can take. But I think it's really also important to to go a little bit deeper and start with philosophical principles. One of the things that I've been concerned about, I mean, it, it's inclusion in my mind is is a given. It should be happening proactively regularly, consistently. But but then at the same time, one of the things that I've noticed, and it's sad because I know why it's happening, but we see this, um, this tendency that, that what's begun to happen, I've seen in, in the industry, is that um, we'll have groups of African-American photographers that are, that are kind of banding together because they're not being represented uh, across mm-hmm. these other conferences and trade shows and workshops and so forth. So they're like, you know what? We're not going to be represented. We're going to band together. We'll at least be able to be in a group with people that, that we can relate to, as you were pointing out earlier. And that in and of itself is creating further, shall we say, separation. It, it's minimizing the importance of community across racial lines. And I'm concerned about that. There's, there's one side of me that, that's sad, and I understand why it's happening. The other side of me is like, but we're, if, if we continue to create the separation where we have groups of white photographers and groups of black photographers and groups of um, you know, Asian photographers or what, whatever the case, and we're creating these separations, that's not helping us work toward this, this idea of inclusion. So mm-hmm, how, mm-hmm. on a philosophical level, yeah. how can we encourage community across race lines of coming together? Um, I know it's not a simple, there's, there's not a simple answer per se, but is there a philosophical principle or principle that can help begin movement in that direction? Well, I have to say this. I, I, I don't think that it's personally, I don't think it's creating further divide. Okay. But I do, I, I do believe it's giving a lot of individuals the platform that they need. Okay. Right. Okay. And I would say that in developing this this platform where you have these individuals coming together in their own respective areas, if you will, I think it, it does help strengthen that community. Um, but I think the one thing that we want to be mindful of is that it, those things shouldn't be used as, to your point, as a way of further creating that divide, okay. but just being a, a place to help strengthen, right? A place to uh, to help me go. So I'll give you an example. I belong to the uh, Multicultural Association of uh, Professional Photographers okay. uh, based in Michigan, and they have, you know, a multi-pronged approach to helping all photographers, right. but my, you know, more especially minority photographers, right? So sure. whether it be business courses or whether it be training sessions uh, to, to help photographers better understand their equipment or their lighting or or where to find certain resources to better their, their business or them as a photographer. They're doing these things to help strengthen that community. And I, honestly, what I think what it does is it helps people be better prepared to do bigger things, right? And what we're seeing is, you know, you're seeing some of the same people that are involved with MAP, are so, they're also involved with WPPI or they're okay. also involved with imaging. Right. Uh, so I don't think those groups are looking to create or further the divide. I think what they're looking to do is they're, these groups are looking to, to have the platform that they've so long wanted, right? And, and we can go on <laughs> for, for a while about this, but I think within these groups, again, where that's where that data lies, sure. and they're using that data to speak to that audience to 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 sell that message, right? Yeah. Of how to get better in these respective areas. If you want to be a speaker, uh, I'll I'll say this: uh, Sean Lee, uh, which is the president of MAP, yeah. has has done a lot to bring African Americans to other stages. Um, and he's done a lot to make sure that they have the things that they need um, when it comes down to speaking and presenting and yeah. things of that sort. Yeah. So, again, I think that these groups are just basically the platforms that individuals need uh, that they've been longing for. Sure. But in the process of doing that, they really help building their culture or that community. Uh, and there are they are spreading it. So I think I think it's a need for that. Um, well, it, it, I want to be really clear about one thing, and, it, and if yeah. I if I miscommunicated earlier, I, I apologize. But I, I wasn't suggesting that anybody was purposely trying to, uh-huh. to encourage no, any kind you. of divide. I just my only concern is that it, it then becomes kind of the thing that I was alluding to earlier. It's like, well, it, you know, I, I'm a black photographer. You're a white photographer. I, I'm an Asian photographer. Right. Um, whatever the case. And we we continue to focus on these distinctions. And and mm-hmm. what I was saying, I was sad about is. I understand why these groups 
come together the way that they do. They, as you said, everybody needs a, a sense of significance, right? Right. And and if they're not being represented in in these majority white organizations, then naturally these groups are going to come together so that they can encourage each other, support each other, and and find some significance through that. So it, it mm-hmm, totally mm-hmm. makes sense that it's happening. My only concern yeah. is, and ultimately, again, the sadness associated with this is, like, why in the world do we live in this world in 2020 where there needs to be that in order for there to be representation of these minority groups in the photography community? Why in the world are these organizations not more inclusive uh, to our original point of conversation mm-hmm. so that there isn't a need to continue to create additional smaller groups for the sake of representing these various cultures? That's just my concern because that I, right. I feel like in the conversation of race and, and inclusion, one of the one of the things that that happens that continues to happen is there's this this so much emphasis on the difference in race that mm-hmm. we're then not focusing on the similarities between us as human beings and mm-hmm. so the the moment that we or the, the moments that we continue to emphasize that we create this distinction i am this and you're that and and this is how we're different versus we're we're in this together. We're fellow human beings. Yeah, we, we we look different. We have a different color skin. We come from a different place. Whatever. But we're in this together. Let's focus on the things that we find similarities and and mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. live there. Make that the number one priority, and then make sure that everybody feels included through that. That's mm-hmm. again, maybe that's a bit too idealistic and too simplistic. But I I just want to make sure that I, I don't think these groups are trying to create more divide. I just want to make right. sure that their existence doesn't continue to encourage that divide, even if it is kind of under under the radar, because we're we're continuing to emphasize, I, you know, I am black, I am white, I am this, I am that. Versus, we're photographers. Let's band together. Let's create community together. Right, and I think conversations like this one and and in future conversations will will take a further dive into into these you know these groups and these these different one offs that we're seeing um and, and hopefully the the hope would be that across the board inclusion would be uh, at the forefront of all these groups, yeah, yeah. you know, I, one of the, the pleasures of, of being a map is that it's it's really really diverse. Okay, uh, you know, the the vice president is 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 uh, Caucasian. Okay, um, so I mean, there are, you know there are so many people that are involved, and that's what I think there's. I would say that they're setting the the tone for what an organization should be. What it like. should be. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, I credit map for that. Um, Absolutely. and I enjoy being a part. And I think the more of these conversations that we have, I think people will start to realize that, yeah, you know, there may be these one, these, these groups, these different groups, but I think at the end of the day, we all need to right find that commonality, that one thing that brings us together in conversation and tackle the issues. Well, yeah, and I, I like that you highlight the fact that 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 Map is really what an organization should be. I mean, the fact that it is multicultural. Again, in my simplistic kind of idealistic mind, I'm thinking, well, that yeah, that's absolutely that's what every organization should be, and we shouldn't have to actually distinguish the fact that it is multicultural because it just is, and that should be mm-hmm. the norm. The reality is, it's not, and that's why we're having these conversations in the first place. But I, I really appreciate your, your perspective. I mean, I, and we really could we could spend hours on this, and and <laughs> right, I and I hope right. and I genuinely hope that that we can come back to this. Um, that I can continue to gain insight and perspective from from your point of view, and I just, George, I mean, your 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 heart is incredible, and that was one of well, the things I was you. so so taken by to begin with when we sat down and had conversation. Um, you have this just this very welcoming vibe about you, so we sat down. <laughs> I, th- I don't know if we, I think we maybe had coffee or something, but we were just yeah. sitting there in the Starbucks, hanging out, chatting. Um, we went back and forth, shared different perspectives, and and ultimately, I'm just really glad that we were able to continue this here today. Where Same. where can our listeners continue to follow what you're doing online? I know we mentioned your site and social media earlier. Can you just remind them of that one more time? Yeah. So I can always be found at gmitchellphoto.com okay. and then George Mitchell Photo on Facebook and then G Mitchell Photo. And that's Mitchell with two L's. G Mitchell Photo on Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. I, I really appreciate that. And and again, I appreciate your heart. And, and I think that's the thing, you know, I've had some tough conversations um, in this realm in the last year or two. And yeah. one of the things that I really struggle with ultimately is that, yeah, I might come off as a bit naive. I might come across too simplistic, but my heart is good. I swear my heart is good. Oh, yeah, for sure, and, dude. And, There's and, no question. Well, and, no and, question. and I know yours is too. And, and I, I think that if we can kind of gather together with with a good heart, 
um, as a photography community and be willing to, to, to be open to these conversations, continue to have these conversations and certainly be open to the, to the notion that maybe, you know, for, for myself, certainly that, that there is more to be learned. There's perspective to be gained through those conversations. Uh, I think we'll all be better for it and we'll, we'll end up in a much better place. So thanks once again for, for being willing to have these conversations, George, and, um, and look forward to continuing these moving forward. Same here. And thanks again, man, for having me. It's good talking with you. Thank you so much for listening to the Boca podcast. Will you let us know what you thought by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is Nathan at photographers edit.com. The Boca podcast is brought to you by Milu the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com.